Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is Megan Tente, and as the tax designated federal officer, I would like to call this meeting to order. We're looking forward to today's presentations and tax vote. Before we begin, we have a few issues to cover related to the teleconference. Tax members and presenters, please keep your phones on mute when you are not speaking. If you'd like to be recognized during a discussion, please message myself or tax chair Richard Gorelick via the WebEx app. Chairman of the TAC, Richard Gorelick, will lead the meeting today. The first tax sponsor, Commissioner Quintens, will give his opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Megan. Uh, welcome, everyone, to today's Technology Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome the chairman and my fellow CFTC commissioners, CFTC staff, our full committee and subcommittee members, and the general public to what will be, again, a fascinating and illuminating conversation. This is the seventh meeting of the TAC since I became the sponsor of this uh, prestigious committee back in the fall of 2017. Since then, the TAC formed four subcommittees to assist its work, the Automated and Modern Trading Markets Subcommittee, a Cybersecurity Subcommittee, a Virtual Currency Subcommittee, and a Subcommittee on Distributed Ledger Technology, all of which have been incredibly active. We've received recommendations embraced by the full TAC from the Cybersecurity Subcommittee that the CFTC publish a statement recognizing the FISC profile, which the agency subsequently did. And today, we may receive a second recommendation from the TAC on data protection initiatives in line with the Cybersecurity Subcommittee's presentation from our last meeting. The Algorithmic and Modern Trading Market Subcommittee has been critical in understanding the implementation of best practices for automated and electronic trading risk controls by both exchanges and firms. Over the course of the past two and a half years, we heard presentations from TAC members, from trading professionals, from FIA, from CME, and from ICE on how risk controls have continued to evolve and help ensure the integrity of the market and prevent unmitigated losses or uncontrolled trading. We heard our own CFTC Market Intelligence Branch staff present a report on the lack of volatility associated with increased automation of market trading across futures contracts. We also heard feedback from that subcommittee on the risk principles for electronic trading proposal that the Commission published earlier this summer. And in line with that feedback, I'm very pleased the Commission adopted a final rule just last week, making only minor changes to the original proposal and recognize that regulation around electronic trading risk controls should be wholly principles-based. Indeed, prescriptive specific rules in this area are actually provide a disservice to the markets, as opposed to um, the idea that they actually enhance its resiliency. I would note that it's been 10 years since the last flash crash with major and material market implications. It hasn't been five years since the last one. It hasn't been one year since the last one. It's been 10. The reason it hasn't been five years or one year since the last major flash crash is not because we've had significant prescriptive risk control regulatory requirements. In fact, we haven't. It also hasn't been because of luck. Rather, it's because throughout that time of the hard work of technologists and risk management experts in the private sector, from exchanges to trading firms, in following the incentives to manage this risk, which have forcefully and continually promoted answers to prevent what we saw before and might see again in the future. The Virtual Currencies Subcommittee has presented on a host of fascinating topics. Proof of stake versus proof of work consensus mechanisms, the potential for and development of self-regulatory like organizations and rules in the crypto trading space, the scope of stablecoin products, central bank digital currencies, and Bitcoin volatility profiles. The Distributed Ledger Technology Subcommittee has presented on derivative market applications for DLT, the ISDA common domain model, custody of crypto assets using zero-knowledge proofs or multi-party computation, AI and machine learning, and quantum computing opportunities, challenges, and the current market environment. In fact, it's been such a pleasure to lead and sponsor this committee because of the continual advancement we've seen in the technology space, none more so than in the virtual currencies and DLT 
um, environments. And I'm very appreciative to the experts we have in those subcommittees. Throughout the time that I have sponsored the TAC, the TAC has been served admirably by over 25 full-time members, and the subcommittees have had a total of over, over 40 members, an incredibly talented and thoughtful group of market participants, firm executives, exchange operators, lawyers, academics, and thought leaders. These TAC meetings would not take place, nor would they be nearly as insightful and purposeful without the astute leadership of our designated federal officer and the associated designated federal officers coordinating and facilitating the subcommittee discussions. From the ADFOs, Scott Sloan, Phil Ramundi, John Coughlin, and George Harada have all been invaluable to our meetings, presentations, and thinking, and are, and are the highest quality of expert and thoughtful public servants. Today, I'd just like to say, will be George Harada's last meeting as the ADFO of the Virtual Currency Subcommittee. He's been a huge asset, a wonderful brainstormer, and a happy warrior in the discussion of these critical issues. And I'm very pleased to announce that Melissa Netram, the head of Lab CFTC, will take over George's role. There's long been a strong partnership and synergy between the work of Lab CFTC and the TAC. Dan Gorfine, Melissa's predecessor at Lab CFTC, was the TAC's first designated federal officer under my sponsorship. I'm pleased that Melissa is continuing that strong tradition which will only enhance each group's thinking and work. And I am, of course, very grateful for the work of our current DFO, Megan Tante, who coordinates, troubleshoots, and provides uncompromising leadership for the TAC. Her hard work, creativity, and spirit are an enormous credit to the agency and to this committee. But out of the 65 plus members that I just recognized of the TAC and the subcommittees, there's one I would like to recognize in particular. Richard Gorelick has been the TAC's chairman for over two years and has always provided a steady hand, a knowledgeable viewpoint, trusted advice, and a quick wit to our internal and external discussions. Richard has also served on two subcommittees, the Virtual Currencies and the Automated and Modern Trading Market Subcommittees, and has chaired the first as well. Richard, it's been a true privilege to have you in this role. And now I'd like to have the TAC leave us for 2020 and perhaps my sponsorship on a very high note. We have a remarkable, fascinating, and in-depth presentation on the DeFi space today, an area that has seen explosive growth, innovation, and a lot of confusion, as well as a re-presentation and proposal for a vote on its recommendations by the Cybersecurity Subcommittee. I'm very much looking forward to today, and without further ado, I'll send it back to you, Megan. Thanks, Commissioner Quinten. Um, we'll go to the other commissioners for their opening statements now. We'll start with Chairman Tarbert, if you have any opening remarks. Yes, good morning, and welcome, everyone, to this Technology Advisory Committee meeting. I'd, of course, like to thank Commissioner Quinten and his staff for convening the meeting. I'm also grateful to you, Megan, uh, for being the designated federal officer for the TAC, uh, as well as for your work in support of the committee. And of course, I must, I must thank uh, Richard Gorelick for serving as the TAC chair and all TAC members for taking the time to share your powerful and valuable perspectives. In the past 17 months, I set ambitious goals for the CFTC to adopt rules that will help promote the integrity, resilience, and vibrancy of U.S. derivatives markets. I also laid out a plan to provide greater clarity to our innovator community. I'm very proud to say that with the help of my fellow commissioners, members of this advisory committee and its subcommittees, and so many others, we've met those goals. As Commissioner Quintens mentioned, just last week we finalized risk principles for electronic trading. Staff from our Division of Market Oversight, working with many members of this advisory committee, including our exchanges and trading firms, crafted a regulation that will set us on the right path to dealing with our ever-changing markets. The principles-based regulation focuses squarely on the risk associated with electronic trading, but it does so in a way that will ensure responses to those risks will evolve as the risks themselves do. In particular, I'd like to thank Commissioners Quintens and, and Berkovitz for their work on the Electronic Trading Risk Principles Rule. The bipartisan effort to make our regulations workable while achieving our important regulatory objectives is a testament to the cooperative spirit of this agency. 
it's also a tangible demonstration of the benefits of having an advisory committee like the TAC. Given how important our five advisory committees are to the work we do here at the CFTC, I'm pleased to announce that we'll be having an open meeting in January that will focus on each of our five advisory committee chairs presenting their accomplishments during 2020 and their plans for the advisory committees for 2021. Once again, I'm so gr very grateful to all of you for your help in advising the CFTC on how we can be a more effective regulator. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Harbert. Commissioner Benham, do you have any opening remarks? Uh, Commissioner Benham might have an issue joining. Can we go to Commissioner Stump? Thanks, Megan. Um, I, I don't have any formal remarks. Um, like Chairman Tarbert, I, I very much appreciate um, Richard Gorelick's um, leadership and Commissioner Clinton's leadership and your amazing organizational skills as, as we uh, enter 2021. I know that there's much more work to be done, but I do want to reflect on, on the amount of energy that Commissioner Quintens has brought to this committee, and I think it's really been a testament to his interest in leading uh, in the innovation space, and, and that's so important for the CFTC and the industry, and so I just wanted to take a moment to thank him personally. Um, but, but I have no formal opening comments. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Stump. Um, and oh, th thank you, Megan, and, and – uh, Good morning to uh, to the committee and, and my fellow commissioners and, and all the uh, participants in the conference. Uh, I too don't have any uh, formal remarks. I, I also would like to uh, express my uh, appreciation to Commissioner Quinten um, for um, his leadership of, of this committee. Uh, this committee is, is is an incredibly important committee, and I very much look forward to the the presentations today. I thank the participants. Uh, Thanks for the, for the presentations, which I'm very much looking forward to. Of course, uh, thank you, Megan, uh, for all the work uh, you put into this. Uh, I, I know from uh, my work on the Energy and Environmental Markets Advisory Committee uh, how much work uh, the DFO uh, puts into this on, on top of your normal duties, and you've certainly been busy uh, with uh, critical rulemakings as well as your service to the committee. So thank you for, for this additional volunteer service. It's a real testament to uh, the, the, the spirit uh, of the CFTC staff uh, that uh, uh, despite all the challenges, uh, people step up above and beyond the call of duty. But thank you, Richard, of course, for your, uh, Richard Gorelick, for your leadership um, and chairmanship of the committee. Again, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the presentations. Um, th thank you very much. Thanks, Commissioner Berkowitz. Um, we'll now turn the meeting over to Richard Gorelick to start the presentation. Thank you, Megan, uh, Commissioner Quintens, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, commissioners, and everyone participating today. I am looking forward to this morning's very timely sessions. To get the meeting started, we will begin with the presentation from the Technology Advisory Committee's Virtual Currency Subcommittee. Uh, this subcommittee is presenting on the growth and regulatory challenges of decentralized finance. Specifically, the subcommittee will discuss the growth of DeFi, a broad category of emerging smart contract-based financial services being built on top of blockchains. And we'll highlight areas of development, detail potential regulatory challenges, and think about possible solutions. Presenting for the subcommittee this morning will be Aaron Wright, Clinical Professor of Law at Cardozo Law School, and Gary DeWall, Special Counsel at Catton Munchen Rosamond LLP. I'll turn it over to Gary Aaron. Thank you, Richard. Uh, and again, you know, we'd like to just, uh, on behalf of all the subcommittee men, uh, members, uh, thank uh, Commissioner Quinten for his leadership of the TAC and his support of the TAC. Um, I always will have a warm spot for Commissioner Quinten uh, as a result of his citation of a Kurt Vonnegut um, short story, Harrison Bergeron, 
from Welcome to the Monkey House in, in response to a proposal by a specific exchange to have speed bumps potentially uh, introduced. Um, creative, wonderful, but I think it's a testament to Mr. Quintenza's um, um, you know, broad breadth of knowledge uh, and the kind of leadership he's brought to this role. We also like to thank George, uh, who has shepherded us through many, many uh, subcommittee um, meetings uh, with wit, with wisdom, uh, and, and uh, just with food perseverance. And we look forward to working uh, with Melissa in, in, in her new capacity. Um, so, Aaron, we've got a, a, a good topic here today, DeFi, and I'm going to ask you right off the bat, uh, what is DeFi, and direct uh, Megan to page two of the uh, slide. That's a great question, and uh, I wanted to just echo uh, what Gary and Richard said. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to uh, go through such an important topic. Uh, so DeFi uh, is an exploding uh, part of the uh, blockchain ecosystem. It's growing incredibly quick. Um, at their core, or at its core, DeFi protocols use smart contracts to create financial services and other products that aim to be non-custodial in nature. Uh, they ideally don't rely on one central party, uh, but in practice, many still and you referenced the word smart contract. Maybe for everybody, you can just sort of explain what that is. Yeah, absolutely. You know, smart contracts, um, they're a bit of a mis misnomer. It doesn't necessarily mean, uh, you know, some sort of interactive legal agreement. Instead, you can think of a smart contract as a small bit of computer code or computer script blockchain. Uh, what's interesting about smart contracts is that each node on a network, a uh, blockchain-based network like Ethereum, will execute a portion of the smart contract. Uh, so once the computer uh, software or script is deployed onto a blockchain-based network, it's difficult to remove that software uh, from uh, being interacted with, with end users. It's difficult uh, to also stop a smart contract-based system from running uh, if it's being interacted with by users. And, and what's some of the basic jargon associated with DeFi? Yeah, and let's uh, proceed to the next slide, if we can, please. So, like many other areas of blockchain technology, um, the, the, there's a lot of jargon that's here. So, to set the table and just to, to level set, we're just going to introduce some terms, uh, which we'll refer through at the rest of the presentation. Uh, so, DeFi applications are often administered via online portals. Uh, developers call these DAPs and they're often supported by individuals or entities that pool together assets into what's known as a liquidity pool, and we'll unpack that a bit more over the course of the presentation. Uh, those that deposit assets into a liquidity pool uh, lock their assets, and they often earn fees and or automatically receive digital assets in the form of governance tokens. And these tokens give the holders the ability to kind of steward and weigh in on certain uh, aspects of how these protocols operate. Uh, the practice of submitting assets to a DeFi protocol is increasingly referred to as liquidity mining, and the process of earning fees and or governance tokens or other forms of assets is referred to as yield farming. Uh, so these are some new terms that you may hear more and more about, especially as uh, decentralized finance grows. And, and, and why are we even here? Why is DeFi significant? Yeah, absolutely. And if we could turn to the next slide, that would be appreciated. Uh, so the reason that we're thinking about DeFi as a subcommittee and we spend so much time exploring it is that it's growing incredibly fast. Uh, currently, there's about $14 billion in digital assets locked in various different uh, decentralized financial uh, products and services, uh, and it's growing at an incredibly fast rate. If we uh, thought about or looked at DeFi uh, even a couple months ago or a year ago, uh, the amount has ratcheted up from, you know, several million dollars to hundreds of millions of dollars to now over $14 billion. Uh, and increasingly, we're seeing kind of a dynamic emerge where over 10% of the amount locked in DeFi protocols is actually Bitcoin. Uh, so you're seeing Bitcoin being deployed into um, decentralized financial protocols, other assets being deployed into decentralized financial uh, assets. Uh, and in a sense, a yield curve is developing around digital assets uh, where folks can deposit them into uh, decentralized financial products, uh, earn fees, or earn other assets, uh, and develop a yield. And some of those yields uh, are exceeding what may be possible to obtain through more traditional financial products and services. 
Gotcha. And and tell us a bit about some of the products and players involved in the DeFi landscape. Yeah, absolutely. And if we can turn to the next slide. Uh, So the decentralized financial landscape is growing, and it's growing really fast. Um, There's a number of smart contract-based protocols and centralized aggregation tools that are beginning to hit the market. Uh, So when looking at uh, the emerging uh, categories of DeFi protocols, there's a number of them. And we're going to focus in on a handful of them today during the course of the presentation. Uh, so in broad buckets, there's decentralized exchanges or DEXs. Uh, and DEXs have been around for a number of years now, but there's been some innovations that have led to uh, a broader proliferation of DEXs. There's borrowing and lending protocols. There's derivatives and synthetic asset protocols. There's also insurance, prediction markets, and a number of others that I imagine we'll start to see emerge over the next you know, six to 12 months. Uh, in addition... And on top of um, a number of these protocols, we're seeing other services emerge, including things like DEX aggregators and also yield and asset management protocols. And we're going to unpack those in a couple minutes uh, in more detail. And one way to look at it, and if you flip to the next slide, um, and this is one way to kind of conceptualize what's emerging. So kind of at the base, you have a blockchain uh, like Ethereum or another blockchain, although most of the activity currently is happening on the Ethereum blockchain. You have a number of protocols that are smart contract based that perform certain financial functions like borrowing, lending, like exchanging, like derivatives and synthetic assets, like prediction markets, uh, like insurance. Uh, And some of those protocols generate their own token. That could be a governance token or a stable coin, or they interact with other uh, digital assets that are tokenized or wrapped, um, things like wrapped uh, BTC or wrapped Bitcoin, wrapped Ether, uh, and a handful of other wrapped assets. And then on top of that, uh, you're seeing services that interact with the below portions of the stack. Uh, so those include DEX aggregators, asset managers, yield aggregators. And feeding into this as well are a whole bunch of integration tools, things like crypto to fiat gateways, which enable users to deposit traditional fiat currencies like like U.S. dollars or euros or another fiat currency, uh, convert that into digital assets, and then onboard uh, user into decentralized finance. You're also seeing Oracle services uh, emerge that provide data to some of these protocols, uh, which enables more complex protocols to develop, uh, also enables them to to build a more complicated thing. Uh, we're also seeing emerge more, and this is a little bit more nascent, uh, know your customer and or identity solutions, which are hoping to either address regulatory concerns, uh, track with, and then there's various different token factories or other smart contract-based systems that enable uh, the creation of assets like governance tokens, stable coins, wrapped assets, et cetera. And, and just so I, I, I'm clear on my understanding, we're effectively talking about self-executing uh, applications that solely rely or mostly rely on software. So let's go. Right. Yeah, exactly. At the protocol level, uh, so self-executing is a bit of, bit of a misnomer, but they can be triggered by end users. Uh, they can send transactions into a blockchain, interact with these protocols, um, and the, these protocols are the ones that are automating uh, the financial function. And in many instances, there's not one central party or a custodian that's managing that process. Okay. And, and what are the benefits of these protocols? And let's flip to the next slide, please. Uh, so, you know, the creators and supporters of DeFi services often cite a number of benefits um, when describing or thinking about why they're developing these uh, new financial protocols. One is lower cost. Uh, so the fact that you can automate uh, a number of aspects of how a financial service may be delivered uh, should over time get lower costs um, because it's available uh, via blockchain and via the internet. Um, there's a tremendous amount of accessibility to these tools. So regardless of where you are, uh, if you're connected to the internet, if you have a wallet installed in your browser uh, or potentially on your phone, you're able to accept, uh, access a number of these tools and services. Uh, that in turn leads to greater financial inclusion. Uh, so the fact that you know, billions of people could potentially uh, and arguably interact with these services uh, could enable more and more folks to uh, to use these uh, financial products and, and hopefully uh, make their lives better. At the same time, you know, to the extent that a decentralized financial protocol has a governance token, uh, it points to a future where you could have community-run financial infrastructure with a number of stakeholders that are involved in that process. 
Uh, so making financial products and services look a little bit more uh, like Wikipedia uh, or a community-run organization as opposed to one run by a central party or a handful of people through a more traditional corporate structure. Uh, the permissionless access is also uh, pointed uh, out as a potential benefit, although that obviously cuts both ways depending on your perspective. And another interesting benefit of decentralized financial products is that they're composable and interoperable. Uh, all of these different uh, services, tools, smart contract-based systems, they're able to talk and interact with one another. Uh, they're able to uh, be stacked together in different ways. Developers also oftentimes describe this as uh, financial Lego blocks where you can begin to you know, uh, stack them together, build new products and services using some of these uh, first emerging decentralized financial products and services uh, as kind of base blocks to build more complex and interesting uh, and potentially useful things. Uh, also, because blockchains uh, are sitting at the core of many DeFi protocols and blockchains have, uh, at least as of today, a uh, fairly high security profile, uh, that means that these services may have a higher degree of security. Uh, also, because blockchains have cryptographic primitives baked into them, and because um, we're seeing more advanced cryptographic primitives interacting with or potentially going to be deployed on blockchains, uh, they could provide a higher degree of privacy. But, and what kind of risk are associated with DeFi? Yeah, and let's turn to the next slide. So like everything, uh, there's lots of benefits, but there's also a number of risks. Um, and these risks are just emerging, and I think we're still trying to get a clear pulse on what these risks are. But one risk is that there's a very high barrier to entry here. Uh, you know, users need to be tech savvy to even uh, interact with or operate uh, these services safely. Uh, the software is very complex. It's more complex than otherwise already complex blockchain-based applications. Uh, that means you need to spend some time to understand how they work. You need to spend some time to understand the kind of core technical mechanics of how to interact with them. Uh, although there's some commonality between a number of these services, uh, some of these services enable the use of leverage, and leverage obviously creates its own uh, type of risk. There's also questions about if there's runs on liquidity, so the assets that are being deployed into these protocols, uh, if, there, if there's a pull uh, or a withdrawal of a lot of that liquidity, will that create some sort of uh, systemic risk or systemic problem? Uh, we're seeing a lot of growth here, but we haven't seen kind of a bear market or where things go wrong and lots of liquidity is pulled out. Uh, the fact that all of these different uh, protocols can interact and talk and be used to build more complexity also introduces entropy and some complexity related to the composability, uh, which um, has led to certain uh, hacks or uh, complicated schemes uh, that, that may be concerning and may create risks. And then there's obviously regulatory questions, which is the thrust of what we'll be describing and discussing uh, during the rest of the presentation. There's also, okay. and if we flip to the next slide, uh, a number of growing pains, right? Uh, so DeFi is growing at an exponential rate, uh, but there still are technical and practi practical barriers that have yet to be solved or have yet to be solved. Uh, one is uh, there's a limited ability of blockchains today to process transactions. Now we're seeing some steady progress here with the, uh, with the, with the innovations like Ethereum 2.0. We're also seeing other ways to kind of increase the transactional throughput of blockchains through things like uh, CK rollups or, or zero knowledge rollups or other layer two solutions. But there's still a long way to go there. Um, and it's not yet able to compete with more traditional, uh, more centralized financial um, uh, services and companies. Uh, there's also comparatively low le levels of liquidity, uh, at least when it uh, comes uh, uh, to DeFi and as it compares to more traditional uh, finance, and there's still uh, questions about the security of the smart contracts themselves. So even though blockchain uh, may be fairly secure, um, this, each individual system that relies on a set of smart contracts introduces its, its own risks and security vulnerabilities, uh, and that also could lead to hacks and other thefts, and we've seen some early examples of that here too. All right, let's, let's dig down a little bit now on some specifics. Um, let's look at those decentralized exchanges, which you said have been around for a bit. How do they work? Yeah, and if we flip to the next slide and then the slide after that. Uh, so DEXs uh, are 
really interesting, uh, and they've made uh, some steady advances over the past uh, couple of years. Um, and at their core, DEXs rely on an automated market maker's uh, smart contract or a set of smart contracts. And what that enables folks to do is trade digital assets without uh, necessarily using an order book. Uh, so this is a little bit of a different paradigm um, that's emerging with decentralized financial protocols. So you can log into a basic website. Um, you can uh, decide which asset you want to trade or purchase or swap, and you don't necessarily need to have that uh, trade routed through an order book. Uh, decentralized exchanges are growing, and they're growing quite fast. Uh, so this is not on a necessarily every day, but we've seen DEXs or certain large DEXs actually have trading uh, volumes that are beginning to rival custodial exchanges like Coinbase. Uh, and it's raising a question as to whether or not more and more activity uh, related to digital assets will move to these decentralized exchange uh, infrastructures and architectures. If we flip to the next slide, uh, we can just start diving in on some of the technical aspects of decentralized exchanges. So um, like we described before, the way that these uh, DeFi protocols operate is via smart contracts. And for most uh, popular decentralized exchanges today, they rely on two smart contracts. One is an exchange smart contract, uh, which holds a pool of one or more tokens. Uh, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's more than that, that users can exchange. So this creates a liquidity pool or kind of a pool of assets that sit there, uh, which different parties can interact with, uh, deposit uh, tokens into, and pull out other digital assets uh, when they're executing a trade. Uh, there's also a related factory contract, which is a contract that actually creates uh, one or more exchange contracts uh, and is, makes it easy to identify the various different liquidity pools that are going to be available on a decentralized exchange. So these two uh, smart contracts work together. And if we flip to the next slide, we can unpack a little bit about why these are important. So these smart contracts matter uh, because they enable the creation of these liquidity pools. And these liquidity pools lessen the need for an order book. Uh, so you're able to deposit assets into this pool and interact um, um, with these assets without the need to match um, uh, people that want to purchase uh, and or sell assets via an order book. Uh, notably, there's no central administrator of the pool. It's maintained by the smart contract. So instead of having a trade or a swap cleared through a central party, uh, the smart contract handles many of the technical aspects uh, of that uh, trade. Uh, these smart contracts are open and permissionless. Uh, so the factory and exchange contracts enable anyone to list the token to exchange. There's no central party that's assessing whether or not the token is a security, a commodity, or something else. Uh, there's no central party that needs to be uh, uh, interacted with in order to create a new liquidity pool. It can happen uh, um, in a very permissionless way. And that's why uh, these smart contracts are in many ways illegal. It uh, doesn't mean that they're illegal. It just means that they've been designed to work at a technical level uh, to enable the trading or swapping of these assets. They don't necessarily incorporate uh, regulatory compliance into it. Um, and that is uh, a lot like how core blockchains work uh, in the sense that they work technically uh, but they may create challenges when it comes to regulations. Next slide. Uh, just to kind of uh, unpack a little bit more, uh, pricing on decentralized exchanges uh, it occurs algorithmically. So when, in, when exchanging one token for another using a DEX, uh, users don't need to be matched with a counterparty uh, via an order book, as noted before. Instead, a purchaser receives the requested token nearly instantaneously from the underlying liquidity pool. So instead of engaging in a peer-to-peer -peer transaction, uh, you're engaging in a pool-to-peer -peer transaction. So you're interacting with this entire pool. And the exchange smart contract acts in a matter akin to a counterparty. Uh, so you're interacting with that smart contract and interacting with a pool of assets instead of an individual peer. peer. Uh, the amount that, of a token that's returned from an exchange is based on this formula the AMM formula, which often factors in the numbers of tokens in the pool at any given time. Next slide. At least as of today, um, because of the way that these DEXs operate, the larger an order relative to the size of, of a liquidity pool, the worse rate a party will receive under the applicable algorithmic formula. Thus, 
uh, the larger liquidity pools of a given token pair were set, uh, this allows for bigger trades, and those trades, uh, if there's a, a large liquidity pool, will have less of an impact on pricing. Next slide. Now, what's interesting is that we've seen in the DEX ecosystem fairly stable pricing emerge, and in part that's occurring because there's uh, third-party arbitragers that profit on any dice, uh, price disparity uh, surfacing uh, for a given liquidity pool. So these parties uh, will make trades uh, that go through different DEXs and also centralized exchanges, and the process of these third-party arbitragers uh, is to create across the ecosystem fairly consistent pricing, particularly for widely traded assets. The protocols themselves also incentivize deeper pools of liquidity in a couple different ways. Uh, one is the underlying uh, smart contracts award fees to those that provide liquidity. Uh, an example of a fee could be something like 0.3% for trade. Uh, they also increasingly award liquidity providers with governance tokens, which again grants those holders the right to weigh in on decisions related to the protocol's operation. Those could be decisions like setting parameters, um, setting the fees, uh, setting other aspects of, of how the protocol and ecosystem may develop. And those governance tokens themselves are traded um, sometimes on centralized exchanges, sometimes on DEXs themselves, and some have a fairly high um, market caps, at least as measured by various different um, uh, various different uh, services and tools. Next slide. Uh, so interacting with decentralized exchanges it, it will look a lot and feel a lot like interacting with any other website that you may view on your browser. Uh, but what's interesting about a number of these decentralized exchanges is that the website itself or the interface isn't being served from a central company. Uh, instead, the website uh, it, or interface is stored on decentralized file storage solutions like IPFS and increasingly over time things like Filecoin, uh, which means that you may be viewing um, the interface from data that's come from num a number of different people across the Internet. So if you go to Google today and you want to run a search, at some point Google Inc. is serving up that website to you. With DEXs and a number of other DeFi protocols, it's getting served up from uh, lots of different people potentially uh, across the Internet and increasingly uh, in that way. Now, that's not always the case. There's some um, decentralized financial products and DEXs that are being served up by the original smart contract developers, uh, but increasingly that uh, is not the case, and over time I imagine that will be less the case uh, as this uh, ecosystem continues to emerge. Go to the next slide. Uh, what's also interesting about DEXs is that there's very, very low barriers to entry. So the underlying smart contracts are generally licensed under open source licenses. And what that's led to is a number of competing forks or implement implementations of similar services. Uh, so there's some variations between DEXs, but because it's um, a publicly available uh, the underlying software and because it's very easy to set up uh, a new DEX or a DEX with a slightly different implementation, we're seeing a whole ecosystem of them emerge. Um, that means that uh, liquidity providers uh, are increasingly you know, moving their assets to different uh, DEXs. Uh, if one DEX, uh, let's say, suffers uh, a hack or uh, has a problem, uh, liquidity providers can uh, move on to another DEX. Let's say that there was an enforcement action or some sort of regulatory against one DEX, it would be easy to set up another one uh, and assets can, can kind of move towards uh, these, new, um, these new DEXs. What that suggests, at least over time, and it's time will tell, that uh, DEXs may become increasingly commoditized. Uh, this may just become kind of a, a base layer, um, and we may just see an entire ecosystem uh, emerge around it. Aaron, do you, do you have an example of a DEX? Uh, I do, and let's let's flip to the next slide, and we can kind of unpack that in a little bit more detail. So, one of the most popular DEXs today is a service called Uniswap, um, and Uniswap is uh, really interesting. Um, it's really the pioneer of this um, uh, this mechanism, where you can make trades without necessarily uh, using an order book. And just to kind of unpack this a little bit. 
uh, let's assume that I'm a trader. I am not a trader, but let's just assume that I am for purposes of this, uh, this example. Uh, and I have a whole bunch of token A, and I'd like to receive back token B. Um, I will be able to you know, load up my browser, uh, log on to, to Uniswap, um, and be able to obtain uh, from this liquidity pool um, a, a price. And so this leads to your question, how is this price calculated? Uh, the way it's calculated is, again, through this automated market maker formula. Uh, and for Uniswap, that formula is quite simple. It's X times Y equals K, uh, and it uses K, a constant, um, and the relative weights of the tokens in a pool uh, to, to, to determine a price. So let's flip to the next slide. And I'll walk through kind of the math. Uh, so let's, again, assume that I'm a trader. Um, I want to exchange uh, some of the token A that I have for token B. Uh, in the liquidity pool at the moment, I'd like to make that trade. Uh, there's 1,200 units of token A and 400 units of token B. Uh, under Uniswap's AMM formula, this would re be represented as 1,200 token A, X times 400 token B, Y, equals a constant of 480,000. Uh, if I, as the buyer, um, want to swap three units of token A uh, for one unit of token B, and I'm willing to pay Uniswap's current 0.3% uh, fee, then a new price can be calculated by keeping the very... In other words, uh, the 480,000 K can be divided by what was initially in the pool, 1,200, plus the three units that I'm going to be adding, plus the fee. And since I'm taking one back, uh, we can see that uh, token B will be reduced down to 399. Uh, the relative pricing between token A and B before the trade uh, was three, but after the trade, it's going to kick up just a little bit to 3.01. And so this type of dynamic pricing can flow through uh, the entire um, uh, deck and this is how multiple users can begin to deposit and withdraw assets, but also get a bit of fair pricing. And again, that pricing gets um, impacted by the amount of liquidity in the pool, the size of the, the trades that individual users want to make, um, and various different other factors in other uh, decentralized exchanges. Uniswap is just uh, just one example. Great. And by, by the way, we will have um, we'll have a break in this presentation very shortly to allow for some questions. How about lending protocols? Do you have an example of one of those? Yeah, absolutely. And let's let's flip to the next uh, slide after that. So, in addition to DEXs, we're also seeing the emergence of various different uh, DeFi uh, lending protocols, and this is a, a very large category. Uh, so, these protocols provide lending or borrowing-related functionality. Uh, many of these protocols enable users to deposit digital assets into vaults and borrow another uh, token back. So you can deposit, let's say, Ether into a vault on a decentralized uh, lending protocol and receive back another token, uh, let's say DAI or CDAI, uh, in, in exchange. Uh, some of these protocols create or aim to create um, a stable digital token through this borrowing and lending function, and some generate a rate of return. And some examples here are Compound, Aave, Maker, and there's a whole bunch of other ones. Let's flip to the next slide. Uh, the way that these work um, is fairly uh, simple. So a borrower deposits one digital asset into a smart contract and receives back another token, usually val valued at an amount below what has been provided as initial capital. Uh, so the loan that's occurring through these platforms is denominated in another asset. So again, see, die, or die. And the amount typically received back by a user is between 50 to 75% of the deposited collateral. Let's flip to the next slide. Uh, so to ensure that a DeFi lending protocol has a sufficient amount of a collateral, deposited collateral is auctioned or otherwise sold if the value of a given borrower's collateral drops below a liquidation ratio. Uh, the lending protocol often relies on outside data fees, uh, and we described those previously known as oracles, uh, to determine the value of the collateral deposited by users into the smart contract system. Um, and um, this uh, liquidation ratio is often set uh, through community-run governance votes. Uh, so this kind of creates an, an incentive uh, to make sure that there's enough, uh, there's enough assets at their core, at the base, uh, for these protocols to operate. Let's flip to the next slide. Uh, some you know, decentralized lending protocols are also enabling what are known as flash loads. 
and flash loans are very interesting, although a bit of a double-edged sword. Uh, so it's a loan that's only valid within one blockchain transaction. So on, on platforms like Ethereum, uh, blockchain transactions can be reverted during its ex execution if certain conditions are not met. So flash loans take advantage of this functionality and fail automatically if the condition of repayment is not satisfied before the end of a relevant blockchain tra transaction. So you can take out a loan and repay it all within one blockchain transaction, and that's proved to be pretty useful uh, for folks that uh, want to take advantage of arbitrage opportunities or other, other types of uh, trading opportunities. So another kind of new innovation that's emerging with some of these DeFi protocols. Aaron, quick question. How do folks know what the rules? You, you, you talked about mathematical formulas, um, how do, and, and AMA, when you talk about the DEXs, how do folks know what the rules are that apply to these lending protocols or these DEXs? Yeah, well, in many ways, the smart contracts themselves set the rules. So to the extent that somebody is uh, sophisticated technically, they can review and look at the underlying smart contracts and understand how they operate. Uh, many of these projects are, are open source. Uh, it's not all of them. Uh, and there's robust sets of documentation or other information that's available uh, describing and detailing how they operate. So the rules are kind of there. Uh, the interesting thing about smart contracts, because once they're deployed onto a blockchain, they're hard to modify, uh, you can uh, understand the rules pretty quickly, and you know that those rules are not going to change over time um, unless there's some ability to upgrade those smart contracts. Uh, so the rules of the game are available, um, and by setting up uh, be sim simple and or complex automated systems with rules that you know are not going to ch uh, change or be modified. <clears throat> Folks are able to interact with them with a degree of confidence uh, and hopefully a degree of security. Right. Earlier you referenced derivative and synthetic protocols. Help us understand what these are. Yeah, absolutely. And if we could flip to the next slide. Uh, so there's also, and, and this is just beginning to emerge. So I'd say DEXs uh, and also uh, decentralized borrowing and lending protocols are the most robust, but we're also starting to see uh, new derivative and synthetic asset protocols emerge. Um, so DeFi protocols are not just limited to these uh, exchanging and lending protocols. Uh, some are also, also enabling the creation of synthetic assets uh, that derive their value from an underlying digital or real-world asset. Many of these protocols rely on over-collateralization, uh, like uh, what we're seeing with borrowing and vending protocols, uh, and or Oracle to maintain price stability. In some protocols, synthetic assets can be generated uh, by any users of the platform. It's a little bit like we saw with Dex, uh, DEXs, where you could create uh, any sort of uh, liquidity pool to trade any uh, form of assets. We're seeing open and permissionless uh, derivative and synthetic asset protocols uh, that may enable comparable functionality in this domain. So let's go through an example. If we could flip to the next slide. Uh, so one example here is Synthetics. Uh, so Synthetics is a protocol that has a native token, SNX, that enables holders to create synthetic assets or synths, um, which can mimic any asset, uh, but today it's mostly used to mimic other digital assets uh, and or fiat currencies. So to generate synths, uh, a user must acquire SNX, and they can do that by participating on the platform uh, or uh, by acquiring it on an open market. Um, and they can deposit that token into the synthetic smart contracts, and in return, the synthetic protocol creates a new synth token of the user's choice. So just by way of an example, um, let's say um, that uh, somebody wanted to create a synthetic version of the U.S. dollar. Uh, they could deposit $1,000 worth of the SNX cryptocurrency and receive back $133 worth of uh, SUSD or, or synthetic USD. Um, the way that the protocol works now, um, you need to lock 750% more SNX uh, into the smart contracts um, than the amount of synth that you receive back. Uh, the pricing data is provided by an Oracle, a third-party Oracle solution, uh, and there's lots of other com kind of complex mechanics in how synthetics works, but this is the core of it. If we could flip forward to the next two slides. And so that means you're going to tell us about aggregation layers. I am. Yeah, so, so that's an overview of some of the emerging, and I'd say the most mature DeFi protocols. But again, things are moving very quickly. Uh, so if we gave this presentation in a year, I imagine that we'll start to see even more uh, and increasingly complex uh, 
T5-related protocols and services that, that are beginning to uh, you know, be developed and uh, have users that are interacting with them. But what's also interesting, and this really roots down into how uh, decentralized financial products operate, uh, because they're composable, because uh, these uh, services can be easily, easily interacted with, uh, we're starting to see additional tools being built on top and, and really a whole aggregation layer that's emerging. Let's flip to the next slide. Um, and there's a number of aggregators that we're being, beginning to see. Uh, and so these aggregators make it increasingly easier for end users to interact with uh, these new types of services, um, and they're all being built on top of these other D T5 protocols, uh, as described before. So we're seeing DEX aggregators, yield aggregators, and asset managers. Flip to the next slide. Uh, so the first category are these DEX aggregators, and what DEX aggregators enable folks to do is access liquidity pools found on multiple different decentralized exchanges. And so some examples here are OneInch and also uh, Paraswap. Up to the next slide. Uh, what's interesting about DEX aggregators is that they're aiming to provide end users with better pricing. So instead of having to go to individual DEXs, uh, you can go to a DEX aggregator and look across the whole ecosystem of DEXs to find the best price. So, in, so instead of other Internet services today that aggregate, let's say, like news content or social media accounts or other types of information, DEX aggregators combine all this token pricing information across multiple DEXs and aim to provide the best uh, price possible. Uh, they're able to do this without actually custodying any assets. So they don't rely uh, on any... Uh, uh, custodianship of underlying assets by end users. The end users keep their assets in their individual uh, wallets. They connect to these uh, DEX-related services. They're able to find the best pricing, uh, and then they'll interact directly with the DEX. Uh, they, these DEXs over time, and it's still too early to tell, but they could, in effect, serve as kind of a search function for DeFi. So if you want to go into DeFi, if you want to um, interact or trade uh, one token for another, uh, you may increasingly go to a DEX as opposed to uh, going to an individual uh, decentralized exchange. Uh, although there's a possibility that the aggregators themselves may be decentralized, uh, it looks like these may be centralized services that, that emerge. Another form of aggregator, if we could flip to the uh, next slide, are yield aggregators. So we're starting to see users of these five protocols look to maximize their total digital asset returns uh, through yield farming. And they're turning to yield aggregators to streamline the provision of liquidity and the earning of, of tokens or other fees. And one example here is uh, Yearn Finance. Let me unpack that a bit on the next slide. Uh, so Yearn Finance is a very interesting uh, G5 uh, protocol and service that's emerging. Um, participants deposit digital assets into the protocol smart contracts, and they receive back a governance token, YFI. Uh, the token provides holders with the ability to vote and invest um, in digital asset strategies through uh, community-generated uh, ideas. So people post up ideas, they vote on which ideas to, uh, to engage in, uh, and then the entire protocol helps facilitate that. Uh, the smart contract uh, collects the proceeds from any of those investment strategies, and then we'll deposit that back uh, to the Wi-Fi holders minus a fee. Uh, there's also a small group of folks uh, that are called multi-sig holders that kind of ensure the security of all the, uh, the proceeds that are collected, um, and they need to sign off uh, on certain things before they're distributed. Uh, so it's a really interesting setup. Um, it's kind of a community-run uh, asset manager uh, run in a very decentralized, uh, very decentralized way without one party that's really uh, handling either the uh, generation of the ideas, the implementation of the ideas, um, with only a handful of folks that are sitting in the background just making sure that things are secure. That's what's All right, and before, and before we take our... Before we break for some questions on this section, how about some? How about the decentralized asset managers? How do they work? Yeah, so this is also emerging. Uh, so we're starting to see a handful of asset managers also uh, popping up on the DeFi landscape. Uh, so because we've seen 
DeFi protocols grow, um, because we've seen a whole range of opportunities uh, to begin to interact with these different DeFi protocols. Tools are being developed to give people a way to track, manage, or hedge exposure to various different tokens. So some of these protocols bundle together different assets. So they'll take entire sets of assets and, and bundle them together and help manage them. Um, or they just simplify the interaction with the underlying uh, smart contracts. Uh, so you could, let's say, purchase an uh, entire set of tokens uh, or begin to kind of manage that process in a more streamlined way. So let me just describe in the next slide a couple of the core characteristics, and then we can just take a, a quick break to see if there's any questions. Um, so a lot like uh, uh, DEX aggregators, uh, what's interesting about decentralized asset managers is that they're non-custodial in nature, right? The control of the underlying asset is never transferred. It can interact with a user's wallet. It's composable, and these uh, services also take advantage of the composability of these decentralized uh, financial products. Uh, they can connect to a wide number of different DeFi products, um, uh, ultimately creating an end-to-end -end experience. So for end users, uh, these decentralized asset managers may be the front page. Uh, this may be one way that users interact with them. Just because they simplify it down, the user experiences are a bit um, cleaner, easier to interact with. Uh, you know, some of these services automatically rebalance and are liquidate assets without additional user interaction, uh, and they're globally accessible, right? These are tools that are available to anyone connected to an internet wallet. So that's a bit of a picture of kind of the emerging decentralized financial landscape, uh, some of the core services and products that we're seeing emerge, uh, and also uh, some, uh, some of the aggregation that we're seeing on top of it. We wanted to just take a quick break. I don't know if there's any questions or we can dive into the next, uh, the next area. We know that that was quite a bit to run through in a very short amount of time. Hey, we'll open it up for questions, Aaron. I'll, I'll take the uh, prerogative and ask one question here. This is Richard Gorelick. You noted early on in your presentation that uh, these D5 projects ideally do not rely on a central party, but in practice many still do. What, from a governance standpoint, are some of these projects doing to ensure that they uh, become or remain truly decentralized? Yeah, so in, that's a great question, Richard. Uh, in many ways, they're pushing towards uh, taking control of these uh, protocols and providing them to the users of the platform through a governance token. Uh, so even though they may have initially created it, uh, maybe they were making decisions on how these DeFi protocols would operate, they're hoping that uh, in the long run that the community uh, of users, supporters, uh, folks that are interested in the core underlying mechanic that, that's being facilitated by the underlying smart contract-based protocol will be managed uh, by folks uh, that hold these governance tokens. Um, and over time, instead of it being managed by one single party, uh, it may be managed by you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands of different individuals. And there's been robust tooling that, that's emerged to make it easier to uh, to understand information related to how these protocols are governed, uh, to weigh in if there's a vote or an issue that, that's up for discussion uh, and manage uh, kind of the, the creation uh, and maintenance of these protocols. I have a question. What mechanism exists to kind of govern sort of the, uh, these protocols on, on things like uh, traditional like leverage ratios as well as kind of uh, implementing excessive fees? How do you, um, what governs sort of how people behave in the implementation of these uh, contracts? That's a, a great question. It's going to really depend on the uh, protocol. So different protocols enable uh, governance token holders to set certain parameters. Uh, sometimes the smart contracts themselves uh, don't enable any flexibility when it comes to uh, certain parameters. So it, it's really going to depend on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Uh, another thing that's, um, that's playing into governance, although it's not uh, necessarily traditional governance, is uh, some of these DeFi protocols, or almost all of them, are open source. Uh, and the fact that they're open source uh, means that everybody kind of understands the core smart contracts that are being used. So if, let's say, 
uh, one DeFi protocol is charging too high of a fee, or if uh, one uh, DeFi protocol doesn't enable communities to set those parameters, then we're seeing um, the DeFi protocol become forked where a new version gets created. Uh, and then liquidity providers or other folks that want a lower fee, want more community participation, um, moving to this forked version of it. So in a sense, even if the governance is not provided directly by the, the construction of the DeFi protocol, the community is forking its way to something that gives more community participation uh, and or potentially over time to lower fees. Thank you. Uh, for, for the transcript, just so we can note that that question came from Eddie Wen. And if anyone else has questions, uh, please announce yourself um, so that uh, it can be appropriately recorded for the transcript. Thank you. So this is Tim McHenry. I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, since these systems, like the DEXs, are open source, how do operators prevent code manipulation, or how do they prevent others from the you know, of vulnerabilities? Uh, is there some peer review? Is that sufficient? Um, are there other controls in place? Or is it just like you said, do users just move on to another service after a hack emerges? Uh, that's a great question. So depending on the protocol, and again, this is on a case-by-case -case basis, many of the software developers that initially create them uh, we'll have the software audited uh, by uh, smart contract auditor. Uh, so these are folks that uh, get paid and will do a security review and an audit, uh, try to find vulnerabilities and assess for potential weaknesses. Um, if there is a vulnerability that occurs, uh, then either people are impacted by that in some negative way, or um, there's sometimes opportunity to upgrade it uh, and to address that issue. Um, and if there is an issue that, that emerges, a pattern that uh, creates a security vulnerability, you know, people then try to improve it or kind of create another version that, that patches up that issue. Uh, so it's a, there, there are some teams that go through this auditing process. There are other teams that don't. They just release it, and they, they kind of figure out if there's an issue um, in the wild. Um, and then if there's issues that emerge, uh, improvements are either made directly by upgrading the underlying um, smart contracts uh, or by uh, creating a new version that may pack up, patch up that issue. Well, thank you. Um, this is Jaime Werke. I, I had a question from FINRA. Um, this is, uh, I had a question regarding, I guess, the use of the governance tokens. I believe I heard someone say that the governance tokens could potentially have a secondary market. Isn't there the potential for the, if the governance tokens are um, taken by parties other than the ones that are actually uh, participating in, in, in the decentralized process? Would there be misalignment of interest such that those who are purchasing the governance tokens could do something nefarious? Thanks so much for the question, Jaime. Uh, that's a, also a great question. And so it's, that is conceivably possible. Uh, so uh, many of these tokens uh, are trading uh, on various different secondary exchanges. Um, they're oftentimes awarded to users of the platform. Uh, so at least off the bat, uh, those users are the ones that are weighing in on these governance-related questions. Uh, some teams um, will allocate a portion of those tokens to the, the initial software developers themselves. Uh, whether or not the software developers weigh in on decisions is, is still emerging. Uh, but uh, to the extent that a, a party acquires a material position of a governance token, uh, they'll be able to, to weigh in on these decisions. Okay, are there any more questions at this point? Okay, Eric, Gary, it looks like we can move forward to the rest of the presentation. All right, and so I'm gonna to start to ask Gary some questions about this, and let's turn to the regulatory and legal side of D5. If we could just flip to the next slide. Uh, so Gary, you know, uh, so we've, we've talked about uh, the overview of decentralized finance, uh, how it works on a technical level, 
Um, let's let's begin to dive in on some regulatory questions. So, in the U.S., uh, you know what what um, what regulators and laws um, you know may be implicated by DeFi. Well, there's, and thank you, Aaron. There's nothing unique about DeFi as far as the applicability of uh, applicable laws and regulations. So, you know, the the common denominator um, of, of of most things out there is that if it's the same business, the same risk, you typically get the same laws applying, and that's exactly the case in DeFi. So, in theory, um, to the extent that anything that DeFi touches um, is governed by an applicable law or rule today. Um, then obviously the, the regulator that's, that, that's, re that's responsible for enforcing that law is, is obviously uh, involved in the process. Um, you know, it, it's interesting, uh, if you go back to one of the first, um, um, you know, regulatory looks uh, in, in the DeFi space, it was actually one of the most famous um, uh, uh, reports, it's called the 21A report, issued by the SEC uh, in connection with a, a DAP known as the DAO uh, that was issued in July 2017. And effectively, uh, the DAO was a, was a DAP that was going to uh, effectively um, uh, you know, reward or pay for projects that were going to be funded by, 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 by persons. Uh, I'm not going to get into the to, into the whole gist of that, which is that the DAO token itself uh, was deemed to be a security by the Securities and Exchange Commission. But you know, right in the first sentence or the second sentence of the DAO report was a discussion of who might be responsible for a regulatory breach. Uh, the DAO itself was an unincorporated organization. Uh, there was a corporation that introduced the DAO, known as Slocket uh, uh, UG, which was a German corporation, and, and it was identified as a potential um, person responsible. Uh, there were co-founders, three co-founders of Slocket. They were considered to be potentially responsible, and there were a bunch of unnamed intermediaries. Uh, folks known as, as curators who would actually be uh, potentially looking at some of the, the projects that might be funded by the DAO. Um, and, 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 you know, the, because it was a report and not a enforcement action, uh, the SEC never really gave its view on, on, on actual liability there. But it, it, it was the first effort to try to figure out who would be responsible, who could be responsible for effectively a unincorporated entity. And that's really what a smart contract is all about. A smart contract isn't, it's just code. Um, and, and, and typically it's the smart contract that's the actor that's uh, potentially violating or doing something to contrary rules. So if we just look at, at, at the CFTC, uh, the Commodity Exchange Act and the CFTC rules, uh, obviously, um, you know, if there were unregistered FCMs or DCMs or CEFs or, or DCOs, um, you know, you know, theoretically, that that's a th those are regulatory issues. If there was fraud, that's a regulatory issue. If there was, you know, ma manipulation or deceptive devices, that's a regulatory issue. CPO, CTAs are uh, rules are are touched by potentially some of the activities of 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 of, of DeFi protocols. Um, you know, and then you know, uh, as as we saw in, in in a recent complaint against Bitmex, the CFTC has has basically said if you were supposed to be registered as an FCM, then you have a duty to supervise. So all these issues under the CFTC are touched by DeFi. Um, you know, elsewhere uh, and indirectly under the CFTC, potentially uh, Bank Secrecy Act, state money transmittal laws, um, uh, other state laws such as the New York Bit License, so the soon to be uh, fully rolled out uh, uh, Louisiana Virtual Currency Act. These are, are these are also laws and rules that could be touched by by DeFi. And then again, looking over at the SEC land, you've got Securities Exchange Act, Securities Act, Investment Advisor Act, all the rules that apply again to ordinary you know issues. Um, uh, you know, DeFi does not get a safe uh, harbor. Now, if we can just uh, turn the page. Um, you know, the issue, though, again, the difficulty, one more page if we could turn, uh, the difficulty is, is imputing liability to somebody. Um, you know, the, some, the, the somebody is, 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 could be the initial drafter of the, uh, of the source code. 
Um, generally in the United States, uh, software development is a protected activity under the First Amendment. Um, you know, and unless there's absolutely no lawful purpose to the software, but that's not the case here, as as as, as Aaron has eloquently shown. Um, you know, there's there's many many valid uses for for DeFi. Now, the First Amendment is not an absolute bar. Um, there's case law precedent. United States v. Mendelssohn is a good example uh, where software was uh, sent from Las Vegas to California. Uh, effectively, was source, it was effectively you know uh, you know uh, code on a floppy disk that related to uh, sports bookmaking, and that was held so integrally related to the bad act that 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 folks were held liable for that. But you know, in general, again, you know, just providing, just writing source code uh, is not is is protected is is considered protecting speech. Um, the other issue is is that. If you were to do something against a, a developer, um, the, the code still is out there. Uh, it doesn't go away. The, the smart contract is still running. And as Aaron has mentioned, um, you know, it's subject to forking, copying, it's source code. Somebody else can take it and, 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 and run with it. Um, so, you know, it, 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 is a, it is a difficult issue of if there is something that's a problem, who, who is potentially liable? Um, you know, and, and, and as Commissioner Quintens himself has noted, you know, enforcing CFTC regulations against smart contracts does not immediately stop activity from occurring because individual users can continue to use the software. That's on the next the next slide. Um, and 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 you know, the only potential here is that if and one more slide through. If develop, as, as Commissioner Quintens has also noted, that if uh, you know developers can reasonably foresee at the time they create the code that it might be used by persons violative of CFTC regulations, then you might have uh, some potential uh, of liability there. Um, there's also you know ancillary action. There's ancillary actors that somehow may be you know part of the original you know, uh, uploading of the, uh, of the source code and, and, and running of the, of the source code. Uh, there may be some folks who, uh, you know, maintain the sole interface, the underlying smart contract. Uh, there, are, there are folks that may maintain control over core mechanics of how the service operates. Uh, you know, and then there's potential deployment of the, uh, of the, of the, of the uh, source code itself. And, 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 you know, obviously those are, those are folks that might be looked at by, by regulators. Yeah, and so this, I guess, raises the question, right? If something goes wrong, how does um, you know, this kind of overviewed, how would the government or the CFTC prosecute a code and raises the question, you know, where may, may liability lie? Um, and so the question could be direct liability, uh, like Gary suggesting against software development. So there's challenges there. Uh, but besides direct liability, uh, Gary, is there anything else uh, that could be considered? Sure. I mean, there's obviously there 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 there's obviously other things. I just want to say one other thing on the direct liability because there has been one interesting case uh, brought by the SEC. Uh, it was a case brought by an individual, Zachary Coburn. Uh, this happened, you know, uh, uh, this you know against Zachary Coburn. He he was the one who wrote and deployed the smart contract on Ethereum, and 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 exercised complete control. Over it, known as Ether Delta, and D Ether Delta basically operated as a as, as a Dex uh, without requiring registration. Um, you know, Ether Delta, as I said, was a smart contract. It executed orders. Um, uh, it, it did a lot of the things that that you described. Um, but uh, according to the SEC, a key it wasn't it wasn't um, it wasn't registered as an exchange. Um, and, and that was a big that was a that was a major major problem um, because uh, uh, Mr. Coburn uh, uh, presumably was so involved in in the in the rollout and running of this smart contract, um, you know he himself personally was named. Uh, and uh, Ether Delta was not even named in the caption of the case uh, because it didn't exist as a legal entity. 
Um, you know, he was required to disgorge as part of a settlement. He was required to disgorge uh, a theoretical uh, profits, fees that he had made, and, and, and sustained a fine. But that's a good. Ex- but that's an example where somebody was so individually identified with the Samoa contract that that allegedly had, um, you know, you know, volatile qualities that it was that it was easy to to, to go after. Um, in, in in other cases, there's potential secondary liability, and this is where things get a little bit more difficult. Um, under the Commodity Exchange Act, as, as this audience well knows, uh, there are two key uh, elements, aiding and abetting liability, um, and we can turn the page on that. Um, or two pages, I think. Two slides, yeah. <laughs> yep. One more slide. Uh, one more slide still, sorry. All right. There's aiding and abetting liability uh, and controlling person liability. Um Let's turn to the next page, uh, sort of as a refresher. I mean, uh, aiding and abetting, um, you know, if a person commits or willfully aids or abets uh, the violation of, the commodity, of any Commodity Exchange Act provision or CFTC rule or acts in combination or, or concert with any other person in such violation uh, or willfully causes an act to be done or omitted, which if directly done would be a violation, then that person could be held liable as a principal. This is a, a provision of law that the CFTC often relies on. And then there's also, obviously, the next page, 13B, um, which is controlling person liability. Uh, any person who directly or indirectly controls any person who has violated any CF, uh, the Commodity Exchange Act provision or rule may be held liable for such violations to the same extent um, um, as, 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 as such controlled person. Now, this is a little trickier. The CFTC has the burden of proof on this, and they have to show that the controlling person did not act in good faith and knowingly induced directly or indirectly uh, the act constituting the violation. But these are two very, very um, strong provisions. Uh, next page. Um, you know, recently um, this, the CFTC settled an action, um, uh, Edge Financial Services, um, and, and, and this was a case in, in, in which a, a, a company and, it, and, it, and its employees, uh, you know, were held or, you know, it was a settlement. Uh, it was an action where the, the, the charge was that the, the company uh, aided and abetted a, a, an individual who had, had engaged in spoofing um, by uh, programming, um, uh, you know, back-of-the-book functionality um, that enabled that. That was the allegation. Um, ultimately, the FTC charged aiding and abetting um, uh, for spoofing and aiding and abetting for manipulative and de- deceptive device um, uh, provisions of, 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 the, of the law and the rule. So, you know, this is this is obviously a tool that that the, that the CFTC has. Um, yeah. So, so uh, there's a, obviously. Um different uh, theories of secondary liability that could attach here, uh, but where would that that secondary uh, liability attach, Gary, Uh, and how do you assess uh, the costs and benefits of extending secondary liability to these actors? Well, you know, as as you mentioned, um, you know, there are a lot lot of folks that are involved in the the DeFi um, universe. Um, There are the liquidity providers, there are the end users, um, that that participate uh, or or potentially facilitate conduct. There's the holders of governance tokens uh, who might be construed to have a controlling interest over the direction of the underlying software. Although we're on, we're on the next slide, um, you know there are again there are multi-sig holders uh, for certain applicable projects that have the ability to control uh, activity. Um, and then none of any of this stuff occurs. Uh, without the validators or miners on, on, on the blockchain systems that actually um, formally execute the smart contract by validating all the tra- transactions and, and letting them proceed. So there's, a, there's a, a large group of persons that are involved in, in the DeFi ecosystem that can uh, potentially be um, you know, brought into the process. Um, but again, the problems with all, all with, with naming any of these persons is that they're, and we go to the next slide, they're incomplete solutions. Uh, secondary liability may only serve as a deterrent, but will not stop the use of the DeFi protocol. 
due to the nature of, of smart contracts and the difficulty of modifying, let alone stopping, their running once they're started. Um, the other thing is, is that, um, you know, the, the, the cure may, you know, the, the, the supposed cure may cause uh, uh, unintended consequences. Uh, you know, it may encourage developers to use more advanced forms of cryptography to obscure transactional records. And, and likewise, the enforcement costs can be very, very great. Uh, you know, depending on, 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 on the legal theory, and, and a lot of the stuff will be untested, um, you know, there, it, it could be great cost to go after uh, particular uh, defendants. Um, you know, now, you know, there's also a certain fairness element in it. Um, you know, miners and validators are likely the folks that make the system go, but they are probably in the least uh, good position to actually understand and assess um, the, the legality of each particular transaction because the miners and validators are mining, are, are validating all transactions on the blockchain. Um, and, and they're just looking to see that certain uh, technical rules are being complied with that allows blocks to be closed and, and added to the existing blocks. Um, so that's, that's a, a, a sort of a very, very difficult situation. So let me turn to you, Aaron, and ask you, is there a path forward to address these um, regulatory concerns and concerns about, um, you know, liability on potential actors? Yeah, that's a great question. If we could flip uh, forward, I think, two slides. One more. Yeah, and one idea that we discussed uh, in the subcommittee was a potential safe harbor. Uh, if we could flip to the next slide. So an alternative approach or one that can complement uh, potential actions uh, brought uh, against actors for secondary liability uh, could be a safe harbor. Uh, and the notion here is that a safe harbor um, could potentially uh, create a regulatory incentive uh, to build and support compliance. Uh, so it could excuse either direct liability against software developers or potentially other DeFi participants if, as an example, uh, the protocol has a lawful purpose and entails no fraud, it interacts or excludes addresses and or jurisdictions encouraging OFAC compliance uh, and limits or bars uh, margin trading. Um, this is, these are just some examples. Uh, there could be other, um, you know, other uh, factors that need to be um, um, uh, addressed in order for a safe harbor to apply, uh, but this is just a couple ideas that, that could occur here. Um, and in many ways, uh, this notion of using uh, a safe harbor is grounded um, in um, in the past, but I, I just wanted to flip to the next slide and just address one of one of the points that's worthy of consideration. Uh, so the safe harbor also uh, could contemplate requiring that protocols are able to implement any future CFTC authorized software systems to enforce commodities related laws. Uh, so this is an interesting concept, a concept uh, I've written about in the past, and other folks are beginning to uh, contemplate. But it's actually using uh, software that's provided by a regulatory body like the CFTC uh, to enforce law. So using software systems as law, uh, as opposed to only letting uh, the rules embedded in these smart contract-based systems dictate how they operate. Uh, so a safe harbor could also en encapsulate that. While regulatory bodies today may not be ready to implement some other rules uh, as software, over the longer arc, uh, my sense is we may see more and more regulatory bodies moving in this direction. Um, and this notion of the safe harbor is grounded in um, in history. Um, in many ways, we began to discuss this as uh, as a subcommittee uh, due to some lessons uh, from the quote copyright uh, wars that occurred during the first wave of the internet. If we could flip to the next slide. And with these copyright laws, um, we saw uh, during the uh, first wave of the Internet, uh, copyright law evolve uh, via the common law uh, to grapple with peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, what happened was when it came to uh, copyright jurisprudence, we, we saw courts uh, uh, create um, and articulate expanded theories of secondary copyright liability. Um, and uh, in many ways, the media and entertainment industries were the first industries to grapple with peer-to-peer -peer networks and peer-to-peer -peer technology, which is roughly analogous to, to what's happening uh, in the blockchain ecosystem. So let's just unpack what happened there. Turn to the next slide. 
Uh, so through various decisions at both the Supreme Court and the circuit courts around the country, uh, vicarious liability or secondary liability is now imputed uh, on online platforms that exercise requisite control over direct copyright infringement uh, and also der uh, derive a direct financial benefit from that infringement. Uh, requisite control uh, has been determined to be a legal right to stop or limit the direct li uh, directly infringing conduct, as well as the practical ability to do so. Uh, it attaches even if a platform lacks knowledge of the direct infringement. Let's we flip to the next slide. Uh, we've also seen um, a new theory of contributory liability that attaches to online platforms uh, that induce or encourage intentionally copyright infringement. Uh, we've also seen contributory liability attached when operators have actual knowledge of copyright infringement and fail to take simple measures uh, to prevent further damage. So between vicarious and contributory liability, we've seen courts uh, be able to grapple with some of the complexity of peer-to-peer -peer platforms like Napster, like Rockster, like LimeWire, and a whole host others uh, by expanding um, liability to um, the, the folks that are running these online uh, platforms if they have uh, the ability uh, to uh, actually take simple measures to prevent further damage, uh, if they're intentionally encouraging uh, infringing behavior, or if um, they have the ability uh, to profit and can kind of control the entire ecosystem in some sort of way. Let's flip to the next slide. At the same time, and this kind of complemented what occurred uh, in the courts with expanded theories of secondary liability, uh, through a treaty, uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was enacted, and the DMCA does lots of different things, but one thing that it does do, it's resulted in the development of a notice and takedown regime, uh, and this notice and takedown regime encourages online platforms to respect uh, copyright holders' rights um, if um, they are notified by a copyright holder uh, of a potentially infringing content that's on the platform, and they expeditiously remove that work, uh, then they're able uh, to avoid potential copyright liability. Um, and this notice and takedown regime, while there's issues with it, at its core, it's enabled large uh, platforms like YouTube, Spotify, Wikipedia, and other services to grow uh, while attempting to balance copyright owners' concerns. Uh, so it's, it's been, in a sense, able to thread the needle uh, where um, uh, completely uh, uh, infringing platforms or peer-to-peer -peer networks that are not trying to respect copyright uh, owners' rights uh, are able to uh, be addressed uh, through courts uh, or through other actions, while at the same time, uh, companies, products, and services that are trying to respect copyright owners' rights, like YouTube, Spotify, and also Wikipedia, are able to flourish and have some clarity as to what their liability uh, may be. Um, maybe we can flip to the next slide. Um, you know, one thought here is that a similar approach could be adopted. Uh, decentralized finance could be regulated uh, using theories of secondary liability under the Commodities Exchange Act or other related uh, financial statutes. Uh, at the same time, a safe harbor, if implemented, could ensure responsible development to protect consumers' interests, to make sure that folks are not being harmed without, uh, without limiting innovation uh, so that the U.S. Um, can make sure it, it remains on top when it comes to building um, and developing and supporting uh, new financial innovation. Uh, so we thought that this lesson from history was interesting, something worthy of consideration, uh, kind of the, the scope of what a safe harbor could be um, would obviously require um, a lot of thought and a lot of input uh, before implemented, uh, but we think it's uh, potentially a fruitful path uh, forward. I know, Gary, you have some thoughts here, so I don't know if you wanted to weigh in. Yeah, I mean, I... I, I, I... I do think this is a, 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 a I mean, I, the, I, this is this is sort of a, a Scylla and Charybdis, uh, a difficult navigation, because obviously there are a lot of folks, uh, and I hate to use the word, the bricks and mortar uh, enterprises in the in the blockchain ecosystem, you know, that have spent a, a fair amount of uh, resources trying to get it right from the beginning, uh, and 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 making sure proactively they they you know they. They did what they needed to do to comply with applicable rules and law. And, and there's also folks who have absolutely avoided 
um, you know, certain markets, including the U.S., uh, because they recognized that there were, um, you know, difficult issues and they, and they didn't want to deal with them, and, and, they, and so they avoided the marketplace and avoided opportunity for revenue uh, in order to, um, you know, uh, not get in trouble with the regulators. You know, what's challenging here uh, and what makes this thing so difficult is that it is effectively, um, you know, non-legal entities that are ultimately doing whatever – the, the, the activity is that may be adjudged incorrect. And, and, and so at the end of the day, it mostly will be secondary actors that are potentially liable, um, and, and, and it's a challenge to, to get at them, and, it's, and, 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 and it raises issue of, of, of fundamental fairness, in my view. But that being said, um, you know, the difficulty here, it's, it's the same issue of granting you know, someone uh, an opportunity to work in a sandbox, um, as they have in the UK or some other jurisdictions, um, if you give folks a, a, a safe harbor, um, you're effectively penalizing people um, who, who ha- have, have incurred the cost of, of compliance and, and, and or avoided um, the, the situation of, of noncompliance. Um, you know, you know there are ways, in my view, that the, S- the CFTC doesn't have the authority to issue something like a 21A order, um, uh, but they they can do a combination of no action letter and 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 and, and a, a a public a solicitation of comments in connection with a proposed guidance, much as they did with the actual delivery uh, guidance recently issued, um, where they where they solicit a wide range of of, of input to figure out you know a, a way to go forward. But you know, uh, you know, Aaron, I, I think you, you know you are right, and many many members of the committee are very sympathetic to the issue. Is that uh, you know this is this is an important development. This is this is a game changer. The idea of having non incorporated entities, non legal persons, not actual persons, um, you know, you know, engaging in the activity that that might be problematic, um, you know, is 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 a is a relatively significant game changer um, that hopefully is. As, as we've made clear, has lots of benefits out there, lots of potential benefits, but obviously has has a lot of risk. So we, we, we need to we need to tread cautiously in this area, uh, but we don't want to inhibit uh, this important development. So what's our final thoughts, Aaron? Yeah, and let's flip to the last slide. And thanks so much for everybody's time and attention. Uh, so in in kind of conclusion and some further considerations. Now, given the emergent nature of DeFi, given the fact that it's uh, grown uh, significantly over the past year, and we have yet to see um, you know, any signs that it will stop growing, uh, the subcommittee is considering future recommendations uh, to the TAC to recommend to the CFTC various different things. Um, in our view, the subcommittee's current thoughts include uh, you know, adopting a wait-and-see approach to see where risks manifest with these protocols, uh, to carefully consider um, whether to impose direct liability on smart contract developers and or miners or validators to prevent spillover effects, uh, and also, as Gary noted, um, to just consider uh, with, with those types of actions uh, the level of fairness um, that would be applied, particularly uh, if uh, there's a thought to apply liability on miners and validators, um, to research and explore theories of secondary liability uh, while, while it's been used, um, in the past, uh, I do think that uh, as applied to uh, decentralized finance um, and thinking about ways in which uh, these theories can develop, more thought needs to be applied there. Uh, obviously, continuing to engage with blockchain developers to stay up to date on new services and ongoing innovation. Uh, the presentation today outlined uh, a handful of protocols that are, that are emerging and they're becoming a bit more mature. Uh, but there are new DeFi protocols um, being deployed uh, that folks are interacting with on a near daily basis, uh, and I don't think we're um, we're just seeing the endpoint of DeFi, but rather just the beginning. Uh, so there's going to be a number of new services, uh, including new services that uh, that uh, expand into options and a whole bunch of other financial products. Um, and as uh, Gary mentioned before. Uh, consider having the staff memorialize a safe harbor in a no-action uh, letter um, to the extent that that seems like a fruitful direction to go. Uh, so that is uh, kind of our conclusions and considerations. Uh, thanks so much uh, you know, for everybody's attention, and we thought we'd open it up to see if there was any further questions.
Thank you, uh, Aaron and Gary, for your presentation. I'd now like to open the floor for questions and discussion uh, regarding the presentation. Okay, maybe uh, maybe you've answered everybody's questions. I'll make one last call and then we'll move on uh, if there are no questions. Let's move ahead then. Uh, thank you, everyone. Let's take a quick break. I think we'll take about a five-minute break here uh, before the TAC vote on a recommendation from the Cybersecur Cybersecurity Com Subcommittee. Once again, I'd like to thank Aaron and Gary. That was a fascinating presentation. I learned a lot, and I'm sure everyone else did as well. Thanks, guys. Take a quick break. Be back in five minutes. Okay, thanks, everyone. Richard Gorelick can open up the TAC vote and introduce the presenters. Terrific. Thank you, Megan. Uh, as our last matter for the morning, the – Technology Advisory Committee is going to vote on a recommendation from the Cybersecurity Subcommittee. The Cybersecurity Subcommittee is going to be recommending that the full Technology Advisory Committee makes a recommendation to the CFTC that it provide clear, concise, and up-to-date guidance on how the CFTC reviews highly sensitive cybersecurity artifacts and sensitive intellectual property. Uh, tech members were provided with the materials for the vote in advance of today's meeting. In addition, the Cybersecurity Subcommittee presented on the background to this recommendation at the last TAC meeting in July of this year. Before I open the vote, two Cybersecurity Subcommittee members are going to briefly reiterate and explain the recommendation. They are Jerry Perullo, the Chief Information Security Officer at ICE, and Hunter Landrum, the Government Affairs Council at Two Sigma. Jerry and Hunter, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. We greatly appreciate the opportunity to speak today to briefly recap our discussion from the TAC meeting in July. As we discussed at that meeting in July, regulated financial institutions, including providers of critical national economic infrastructure, have identified significant risk in the collection, concentration, storage, and securing of highly sensitive cybersecurity artifacts and sensitive intellectual property during regulatory examination procedures. In recent years, these concerns have been buoyed by actual breaches that have occurred at several national regulatory agencies. Now, to date, various national and international regulators have taken different stances toward the, the collection of this data. Jerry, could you discuss a bit more? Sure. Uh, thank you, Hunter. Um, yeah, so you know, being a, a large multinational and dealing with many different regulatory ju jurisdictions and different regulators around the world, we really get to compare the way uh, behaviors vary, um, including here within the United States. Uh, and so you know, I wanted to flag that um, the commission in particular has actually been very agreeable and very practicable uh, when it comes to dealing with this issue. And we deal with um, both on the clearing side as well as the uh, market side. Uh, and what I mean by that is that when asking for particularly sensitive data, such as penetration test results that may show our vulnerabilities or inventory systems and diagrams, um, the Commission has been very agreeable to um, view those artifacts at, at a, a shared location, take all the notes they want, that sort of thing, versus taking them away. And we enjoy that. And the real push here is to say let's codify that um, and to protect um, you know, both the critical infrastructure entities as well as the, the commission itself when it comes to housing these artifacts. Um, and, you know, by way of contrast, I'll note that, you know, other agencies have asked firms like ours to produce and transmit over into their care things such as not only the, the diagrams and vulnerabilities I mentioned, but even things like the usernames of individuals or privileged access to systems. And things can get um, pretty forceful pretty quickly in a regulatory relationship, and that jeopardizes really the, the whole ecosystem. So um, all this vote is really asking for is to have uh, a review performed and to codify some of those behaviors and practices so that um, things don't change in the future uh, and that examiners are still able to access the data that they need. We don't want to lose that in any way, but they're able to do it in a secure manner 
by minimizing taking possession of any of these artifacts where it doesn't directly contribute uh, to the cause here. And then lastly, I'll mention just in the, for the sake of, of a quick update, you know, many of us in the cybersecurity world, especially in financial services, um, overnight have been working on a uh, breaking um, breach at a third party. Uh, and it's a vendor that apparently was compromised during the year, and we're learning that that led to the compromise of um, additional vendors as, where, as well as U.S. government agencies specifically. So a lot of you will have woken up to this news this morning. And I think this is just exactly illustrative of what we're talking about here with third-party risk. Uh, and it's just near impossible to secure every single avenue, and rather the tack that all of us take in the private sector um, is to just simply limit the amount of data that needs to live outside of our walls to avoid these issues where it's really not directly helping the relationship. And so we're just asking that the Commission, as well as other regulators, um, you know, value that approach and support it uh, where it doesn't get in the way of their examination responsibilities. So thanks again for hearing us out. Thanks, Jerry. And as Jerry noted, the CFTC has dedicated itself to this concern and continues to be a leader in addressing this issue through the TAC and through Commissioner Stump's specific initiative on data protection. But as we said, the lack of policies and procedures today to determine when and how sensitive information is securely reviewed continues to make the process ad hoc and more difficult both for CFTC staff and market participants. So we would you know, urge you to take this vote today to provide clear and concise as well as up-to-date guidance on how the CFTC should interact with these cybersecurity artifacts and sensitive intellectual property. And we would also encourage the Commission to move forward on the topic to provide clarity and reassurance to the marketplace. So thank you very much for the time and attention on this issue, and we're happy to answer any questions if there are any before the vote. Thank you, Hunter and Jerry. Uh, do any tech members have issues to discuss with respect to the vote at this point? Okay, hearing none with that, I now move that the TAC adopt the recommendation from the Cybersecurity Subcommittee on making a recommendation to the CFTC that it provide clear, concise, and up-to-date guidance on how the CFTC reviews highly sensitive cybersecurity artifacts and sensitive intellectual property. Is there a second? Second, DeWall. Okay, thank you, Gary. I now will call for a vote on the motion. Uh, I'll ask all TAC members to unmute themselves at this point. All those in favor of approving the subcommittee recommendation, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Any abstentions? Uh, yes, uh, Richard, uh, NFA, uh, this is Tim McHenry. I have to abstain because of our regulatory capacity. Okay, great. Uh, duly noted. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the motion carries. And thank you, everyone, for the for the work on that. That will be very helpful. Okay, so now um, we will move to uh, closing remarks. Thanks, uh, Richard. Before we, yep. Go ahead, Megan. Um, okay, so now that concludes the presentation and the vote for the tax meeting. We're going to move on to the concluding remarks, like Richard noted. Um, Commissioner Quintens, would you like to go first? Uh, thank you, Megan. I don't have any official closing remarks other, other than to uh, specifically thank Aaron Gary for the um, great presentation that they gave us. Uh, lengthy, in-depth, insightful, uh, helpful, um, very clear. Uh, hopefully it will be a uh, springboard for anyone who wasn't very familiar with DeFi um, before that uh, to um, uh, further educate and update themselves um, on, in, in this fascinating and, and uh, fast-growing area uh, that's obviously providing value uh, and excitement, but um, uh, is, is posing um, questions uh, that would better be, be uh, cleared up um, and uh, ensured does not jeopardize uh, that value and growth. Uh, so I would specifically like to thank them 
Thanks again to all the TAC members and subcommittee members. Uh, Richard, thank you for your leadership, and uh, thanks to all of our CFTC staff, uh, Megan, you in particular, and appreciate the, uh, uh, my, my fellow commissioners joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Quintens. Chairman Tarbert, do you have any closing remarks? Um, Chairman Tarbert might have had to leave the meeting. Commissioner Benham. Um, Commissioner Stump. Thanks, Megan. Um, I just wanted to echo the things that Commissioner Quintem said. I, I personally always find these meetings to be extremely beneficial. And in particular, the two subcommittees that presented today are, are have been tasked with providing input on things that I personally have found to be a struggle over the past couple of years. And it, it is just a result of the fact that our markets are constantly changing and evolving. And um, well, I'll start with the, the second presentation first. Data protection is extremely important to me, and I thank the subcommittee for all of their efforts to try and help us as an agency to ensure that we have all of the right um, metrics in place to ensure that the data we take in or the data we require is properly protected. With regard to the first presentation, I just wanted to say I found it extremely timely. Um, there was discussion about a, um, the manner in which we apply our regulations in, in this vast new world, which is not how we would traditionally have applied our regulations. And each year when I'm considering a, a number of uh, enforcement cases, I often find myself thinking through the, um, some of the questions that were raised um, in today's presentation with regard to secondary liability and, and, and the manner in which we exercise the authorities we have to ensure market in integrity, but also preserving innovation. So I just thought it was a tremendous, a really great presentation. I wanted to thank the presenters and the subcommittee. Um, and, and again, wanted to thank everyone who had a hand in organizing today's meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Stump. And Commissioner Berkowitz, any closing remarks? Yeah, thank, thank you, Megan. And I, I too, um, um, I'd like to thank the, the participants. Um, very, very informative presentations. I, I would just note I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the uh, uh, committee's further thoughts uh, on um, uh, on the issues uh, such as you were talking about safe harbors and and, and what the commission's um, regulatory responsibilities uh, should should be in this area. So I. I, I I, I very much uh, appreciate the subcommittee take, the, excuse me, the committee taking the initiative on this. I would just note that uh, Section 3 of the Commodity Exchange Act, which outlines the findings and purposes of the uh, Commodity Exchange Act, one of the, in addition to uh, promoting market integrity, one of the fundamental purposes is to promote responsible innovation and fair competition. And I, and I think uh, the, the presentation in one of the slides uh, and it was talked about how, how to balance those um, uh, or, or maximize both of those objectives. We want to encourage innovation. Um, some of the technologies described uh, here today really at the forefront of, of the markets. At the same time, um, we want to maintain fair competition um, among all market participants those who have uh, new methods of competition as well as those who are employing the traditional methods of competition. Um, so uh, how, how we achieve and maximize those objectives is, is, is something um, we, we must always try to do, and I look forward to the, uh, the committee's uh, further um, uh, advice, recommendations, and information on that matter. So again, um, thank, uh, thank all the participants um, uh, for today's excellent presentations. Thanks, Commissioner Berkowitz. Um, and Commissioner Benham is having a little issue with his line, so we're going to give him one more minute um, to hopefully get on.
Okay, he can't get the line to work, so he'll pass. Um, but with that, thank you, everybody, once again. Thank you, Richard. Um, and this meeting is now adjourned. That does conclude today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time.